Hey, let's be honest, that never gets old, does it? <laughs> I mean, the Terminator, I'll be back. And uh, you know what I realized was he ripped that off from somebody, didn't he? Like most of us know, this is kind of embarrassing, most of us know that line, and he uses it in different Terminator movies and actually different movies. You can Google a whole montage on I'll Be Back, and it's crazy. And uh, the scary thing is many believers don't realize that it wasn't the Terminator who said that first. Who said it first? Jesus said it first. 2,000 years, someone's like, I don't know. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, the savior of the world to his disciples and future disciples, that's you and me, he said these words, John chapter 14, verse one. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. The two go together. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, here it is, what? I'll be back. I'm coming back. I'm going to take you with me so that you also be where I am. Well, welcome back to our series in the New Testament book of 2 Peter. Last week, James tackled, um, arguably, the hardest passage in the book of 2 Peter, and he did a fantastic job. If you haven't heard his message, go online, download that, listen to it. You will be blessed. Take notes. It's really, really good. He challenged us from the text in, in, in many ways, but two things that I really pulled out. Number one, he challenged us not to go back to our, our old sins. He said, why? like a dog returns to its vomit, why would you do that? Why would you go back to your old sins? And then secondly, he challenged us not to fall prey to false teachers who refused to submit to Jesus' authority, and they were trying to seduce others to follow their teaching. So the question is, why? Why would they do that? Because that's what false teachers do. Misery loves company. False teachers do not want to be left alone in their, in their falseness, but they want to develop a following to, to join them. So in this final chapter of his two letters, Peter is going to focus on future hope. This message is about how to answer sarcastic skeptics who ridicule the idea of the second coming of Jesus Christ. By the way, the early church lived every day expecting Jesus to return. You know, in our typical greeting, in our culture, whether it's in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, we say something like this, hey, good morning. Hey, good afternoon, good evening. In a Jewish culture, especially for first century Jews, and, and uh, even now to some extent, but especially even first century believers, they may have been tempted to say shalom, which means peace. Peace, it's a typical greeting. But these first century believers, they incorporated a, a, a new word, an Aramaic group, word called Maranatha. And it means the Lord comes. And so every time, like, if Jim and I were to greet one another, I'd say, Maranatha, Jim. He'd say, Maranatha, Lee, the Lord, the Lord is coming. To which you're probably thinking, dude, that's crazy. Like, who says that? Who even thinks that? If you, go, if you go around saying Maranatha these days, there, there are plenty of people who will think, man, so, something's not right with you. Just as there are sar sarcastic skeptics today, they were around in Peter's day as well. So let me do this. Let me give us an overview of the talk this morning. Let's go 30,000 feet here, okay? The first thing we're going to talk about is scoffers. Scoffers are going to scoff. They always have, they, they always will, but thankfully... Secondly, this morning, we're going to talk about God's compassion, which leads to his patience, and that's a good thing. And then lastly, people get ready. People get ready because Jesus, Jesus is coming. All right, let's start with our scoffers this morning. They're going to scoff always, 2 Peter chapter 3 in, in verse 1. Dear friends, some translations would say uh, beloved. It is a term of, of endearment. Um, Peter is old at this, at this point. He is nearing death. Kind of like when we went through 1 John. At that point in his life, John was, was old. He was on the island of Patmos, imprisoned. And so you can imagine old Peter writing this letter, desperately wanting to convey some truth before he dies that they need to hear. And as James pointed out last week, they wouldn't have got it in segments. They wouldn't have read a verse or two or six verses, kind of like we teach it. 
what they would have done is they would have gathered everyone around. It could have been a bunch of house churches. Various churches in various regions would have come together, opened up that scroll with just eagerness. They would have sat there as, as the elders, the teachers would have begun to read Peter's letter. So dear friends, beloved, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as, as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and then the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Verse three, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. And they'll say this, where is the coming that he, he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Scripture defines, and I'm going to say this twice, it's really important, defines the last days as the time between Jesus' birth and when he comes back again. Let me say that again. Scriptures define the last days as the time between Jesus' birth and when he comes back again. So, for the last 2,000 years, everybody's been living in the last days. Could have been a week after Jesus ascended to the Father, last days. Could have been uh, AD 400, last days. Could be 2019, we're in the last days. And so, as long as there has been last days, Peter says, there, there has been scoffers. There's a present tense in this verse, there's a, a future tense. There's been mockers, people who make jokes about the things of God, who ridicule anyone who, who believes such nonsense. There were scoffers in Peter's day, there are scoffers today. And what these scoffers question isn't new. They say in verse four, hey, <laughs> great man, where's the, Peter says, they're gonna say, where, where's his coming that he promised? I mean, come on, at least the Terminator said, I'll be back, and he came back. I mean, with a car crashing through the police station, but he came back. Jesus says, I'm coming back. Yeah, really? Where are you? I mean, we're, in, we're impatient, aren't we? Man, I'll, I'll drive by Sonic, especially during happy hour. For I like to get a slush. And, uh, and if I see more than three cars, I'm like, God, that's a sign that I don't want to wait that long. I know, a lot of you have done that, haven't you? Now, Chick-fil-A is another thing, right? But how crazy is Chick-fil-A? Two o'clock in the afternoon, it's packed. What's going on with that place? We don't like to wait. Where is Jesus? Where's his promise? I, at least the Terminator came back. Here's the basis of some of the things that we hear today that I'm sure Peter heard. How can any rational thinking person believe that someone who lived and died and was buried 2,000 years ago is actually going to show up flying around with a bunch of angels as the trumpet sounds? How can anyone believe that some loving God is going to wipe out people who don't believe in his son and only let some special born again people into his happy place? Come on, Lee, let's get real. I sat across the table from two people a few months ago and I was sharing with them the gospel. I had equity, I had relationship, um, but they didn't know Jesus. As I began to tell them my story and begin to tell them what God has done and begin to share the things with God, at one point they looked at each other, had a smirky smile, and they looked back at me and they said, get real. Really? And I'll be honest, in that moment I felt this small. I was like, oh, I just, get Really? You speak of all these, come on, really? Verse three says one of the reasons they, they mock, and this is really prevalent today, is because they're following after their own evil desires, better translation, their own lusts. It has a sexual control, lack of accountability connotation. One commentator put it this way. He said, they fearlessly seek to indulge their fleshly appetites. And here's what they do. He says they advocate permissiveness with total disregard of any impending judgment. Aldous Huxley, the late British philosopher, author, and atheist, he wrote this. It's a, it's a little nerdy and deep, but it's, it's sadly insightful, right? He said this, the philosopher who finds no meaning for this world is not concerned exclusively with the problem of pure metaphysics. 
No, no, it's more than that. He or she is concerned to prove that there is no valid reason why, why he personally should not do as he wants to. He goes on to say, for myself, the philosophy of meaninglessness. Man, that's a bummer. That's a bummer. The philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation sexually and politically. I mean, at least he's honest. Here's what he's saying. He's saying this, deny the existence of God or at least accountability to God and you can follow the desires of your heart and do whatever you want to do. You're free, you're free to sin. Why? Because there's, there's no sin. Now let's, let's not take that conclusion too far, right? We've got to steal from God to a certain extent. Are you free just to go through a stoplight? Well, yeah, well, you could kill somebody. Are you free to just to kill somebody because you want to? Well, no, well, you got to steal from God a little bit, but, but you're free to sin because there is no sin. You have ultimate authority over your own life. Then he comes up with this rhetorical question. And the false teachers, they say this. They say, well, hey, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of, of creation. So he's not coming back. I, I, I haven't seen him come back. And oh, by the way, everything's just the same as it always is. Let me give you a $5 word. This is a big fancy word. They ascribe to what's called uniformitarianism. You say, well, what's that? This is the belief that what's governed natural processes in the past will continue to govern them in the present and into the future. In other words, the laws of nature are constant and unchanging. They're uniform. The sun has come up, it goes down. The seasons have followed each other. The tides have risen and fallen for tens, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years in perfect order. Therefore, it is just business as usual. Hey, man, it's a closed system. It's a closed system. There's no savior that sneaks in there, no resurrection. And certainly there's no thought, as the scriptures say, that the sky might be rolled up like a scroll and the earth purged with global fiery judgment um, by the returning Christ. That would be absolutely un thinkable in your closed system and unimaginable. So, so what's, what's Peter's response? His response to their scoffing is that they have bad memories and oh, by the way, judgment is coming. Verse five, but they, they deliberately forgot that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being. They, they, underline that word deliberately. They knew better. But they said, <laughs> I want to live my life. I want to do my thing. You know, it's interesting. Romans 2 says that the laws, the ethos, the commands of God are written on our hearts. Solomon said that eternity has been placed in, in, our, in our hearts. We know better. We know it. Like Psalm 19 in Romans 1 declares the glory of God in creation. Like we see that mountain, that sunset, that, that wild animal out and you're like, this is, um, this is crazy. There's gotta be something more. But we deliberately go, nah. This is what they were doing. I'm gonna deliberately forget. Verse six, by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment, second judgment and destruction of the ungodly. He reminds them that the first judgment came with water in the days of Noah. No one believed. They, they never felt rain. They never felt a drop. The scoffers scoffed, the haters hated for 100, 120 years. They laughed and mocked. And then, what, what is that I just felt on my nose? What is, what is this strange substance falling from the sky? Oh, wait, 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 hold on. Could, could Noah have been right? And the flood came, first judgment, and wiped everybody out. 
Peter says the second judgment will come with fire and, and destruction. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 15, you, you see the Lord is, he's coming with fire. Not only that, but his chariot is like a whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For with fire and with his sword, the Lord will execute judgment on all people and, and many. Many will be those slain by, by the Lord. Joel Joel chapter three in verse 15, another prophet says, the sun and moon will be darkened and the stars will no longer shine and the, the Lord will roar from Zion. Wow. And thunder from Jerusalem and the earth and the heavens will, will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people and a stronghold for the people of Israel. Now, if I ended my talk right there, we'd just go, come on, man. What a bummer. Really? Really? And sadly, maybe there are some in Christendom that do that. They just bring all the bad news, but there's no good news, and I apologize for that. But there is bad news. Good news isn't good news unless there's bad news. Right? I just want happy. Give me happy all the time. <laughs> Flies in the face of reality. There's bad news out there. We, we're sinners. We're lost. We need a Savior. So if we stop there, it would be bad news, but, but some good news is coming. Secondly, this morning, God's, even though the scoffers are going to scoff, God's compassion leads to his patience, and that's a good thing. So the scoffers are mocking God. Hey, if you're really true, then come back and, and, and prove it. But as I just read those verses, they, they don't want second coming Jesus. Everyone thinks, when they think of Jesus, they just think first coming Jesus. He's a little baby. Just a cute little baby. He's so sad. Oh, look at you. Swaddled up there in your little nest of hay. How about some eggnog and a present and some lights? That's first coming, Jesus, right? Oh, you're the incarnate little baby. Now, we don't even know what to do with grown-up Jesus, but second coming, you don't want second coming, Jesus. if you don't know him. That's why he's patient. Isn't, he, isn't that just like God? People raising their fists. You're a liar. You're not coming back like you said. And he's still, if that were me, I'd be like, here I come. You want some of this? That's why we're not God, right? You want some of this? I'll give, I'm coming now. I'm coming early. Second coming, Jesus will come with fire and destruction to rescue the righteous, but destroy those who don't believe. And God knows this, so thankfully he delays. Two reasons why from the text. Number one, um, God's clock is different than ours. Verse eight, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are, are like a day. Peter's answer is that from God's experience of time, it hasn't, it hasn't been that long. You say, why? Because God stands outside of time. He created time. He's not beholden to time. Time is for us. The analogy I use, which every analogy will pale in comparison, we're like 1D, we mess around with 2D, and we're like, oh, 3D. God is 32D. He's just way out there. There's no goggles you can put on to go, oh, there's God, 3D. You can't do that with God. So he stands outside of time. Since he's immortal and doesn't age and doesn't forget and sees all history at a glance, he's never bored. Clearly, he doesn't experience time like we do. So when Jesus comes back and stands on this earth to make it his own, he's gonna say something like this. Man, it seems like just yesterday I was here. But please don't be deceived. It's no argument against God's second coming that 2,000 years have passed since his departure. From God's experience of time, it's as though Christ arrived at his right hand the day before yesterday. And this is good. Why? Second reason, the most important reason why God delays is that God wants sinners to repent. That is, he's super, super compassionate. Verse nine, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. As they're screaming at him, you're slow, you're never coming back. Instead, he's patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. That's why he's waiting. 
In the immediate context of these verses, to me it's thrilling when we realize why, why Jesus' return appears so slow. His delay is a sign of his, his patience toward mankind. God is long-suffering toward, toward rebellious people. And the scripture says this, there is no one righteous, no, no not one, and that men and women are dead in their trespasses and sins, that everyone deserves, deserves hell and eternal separation from God. But Peter says this, hold on, God is patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. So what does God do? Well, he holds back judgment in the flood for 120 years while Noah preached righteousness. God was patient in judging Sodom and Gomorrah. God was patient with Israel for 1,500 years. God was patient toward Paul, the chief of sinners. And God is patient toward, toward you and me. I mean, think about our own lives. I was thinking about this this morning. How many times have I knowingly disobeyed God? At the age of 17, I gave my life to Jesus. I turned from my sins. I turned to him each and every day. I'm growing in grace and knowledge. And there's sometimes, and I'm a pastor, I just go, you know what? I want to sin. I want to say what I shouldn't say right now. It's going to feel good in the moment. I just want to gossip. It just feels good. I want to speed. I want to get angry. I want to make it about me. And I know I'm doing it ahead of time. Premeditated sin. The writers of God's word tell us that if it were not for God's grace, who could stand? Who could stand? The Lord is buying time so more people can come to know Jesus. He wants everybody, prodigal son, prodigal daughter, crazy uncle, angry aunt, intellectual cousin, stubborn friend. He wants everybody to have a chance to hear the only message that matters in its salvation through faith in Christ alone. Do, do you want to see God execute judgment or do you want him to be patient and wait And this is the theme of God's word. I'm going to pull out some scriptures, not many, but some, and I just want you to see his compassion and his character. Let me read through these quickly. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6, and he, he passed, as he passed in front of Moses, he proclaimed the Lord. The Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, is slow to anger. He abounds in love and faithfulness. Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Psalm 86, verse 15, but you, Lord, man, you're compassionate and gracious. You're a gracious God. You're slow to anger. You abound in love and faithfulness. Ezekiel 18, 23, God says, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? Jonah 4, 2, I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Romans 2, 4, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Romans 9, 22, what if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, instead bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? 1 Timothy 2, verse 3, this is good and pleasing and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of of the truth. That's like this many scriptures about how good and gracious and kind and loving and patient God is. So you, next time you hear someone say, man, you, you, just, you serve this wrathful, mean, terrible God, I would love to say, uh, just read the Bible. Not true. Might be a caricature from a, a meme or a blog you read, but read the Bible. But the Lord will not delay forever, right? For the ungodly, a day of judgment is coming. But right now, this is the good part. Right now, men and, and women have a choice to repent of their wrong views of Jesus, to change their minds based on the truth as it's revealed in Scripture, and to turn from their sins and turn to a loving, compassionate, gracious God. Scoffers are always going to scoff, but God is still patient and compassionate. Lastly, lastly this morning, with all this in mind, 
Peter says, Jesus says, get ready because I'm coming back. Second Peter 3 and verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. Hey, we just read that. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. In this verse, Peter reveals that the Lord will return in power. There is coming uh, the day of the Lord. Others call it the day of Yahweh. Others call it the day of the wrath of Jehovah. That day spoken of by the prophets, by Jesus, and by the apostles is the day God's decisive intervention into history for judgment and universal restoration. That will be that day. And it will be, make no mistake about it, a time of terror for the ungodly. It won't be first coming, Jesus. But let me say this. It'll be a time of joy for believers. Peter is advising his readers and us some 2,000 years later that they need to watch for this day to prepare for it and not be misled by false teachers. If I may, let me just address followers of, of Jesus right now. Um, you may be here and I'm so glad you're here and you're like, ah, I don't, I'm not really a follower of Jesus. My friend invited me. I'm, I'm enjoying the bread. Uh, I showed up to the game yesterday, which did feel like judgment too, but now I'm here. <laughs> They're going to get better. Hang on. You know, hang in there. I heard someone say not before the Lord comes. No, they're going to get better. <laughs> and you're here and, and I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I am you. 20, 30 some years ago, I sat where you're sitting, not this exact gym, but a small independent Baptist church, and I was just kind of listening as an unbeliever, just kind of there. Thank you for being here, but if, if you're a believer here, I want to address you right now. I want to ask you this question. I'll ask me too. Are, are we ready? Jesus said that we need, I didn't say this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know how to say this. I'd be a hypocrite. He said that we need to live our, our lives postured, ready for his return. Matthew 24 and verse 42, Jesus said, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. And get this, and I don't understand it, but not even Jesus knows when the Father is sending him back. Mark chapter 13 and verse 32, Jesus said, but about that day, the day of the Lord, the day of Jehovah's wrath, or our, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So in light of this, be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will, will come. And I would just say this, because we don't know when Christ will return and nor does Jesus, it's fruitless to spend all of our time trying to figure out when he's coming back. Theologians call it the eminent return of Jesus. It just means... He, we think this has to take place for this to take. He can come back whenever he wants. There's whole cottage industries making millions of dollars trying to predict when Jesus is going to come back. And that's not what Jesus wants us to be about. He said, well, Lee, what does he want us to be about? What does he want us to focus on? I put this, literally wrote this in this morning. I want you to see this. He wants us to focus on and eagerly long for Christ's return in the way that we live. Remember the Apostle John's response at the end of Revelation? Revelation 22 and verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I, I am coming soon, amen. And what does John say? Come. Come, Lord Jesus, let's go. Is that us? 
I'm mindful of the Apostle Paul writing from a prison cell, probably dictating it to someone else, chained between two guards. And he says to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter three, in verse 20, he says, but just probably just reminding himself, but also he says it to us, our citizenship isn't here, it's in heaven. And because of that, we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies to, um, so that they will be like his glorious body. Is that us? Do we eagerly await and long for Jesus' return? My question is, how, how are we doing with this? And I know for some in this room, you are prepared, you are ready. Lord willing, many of you, you're, yes, you live, you spend, you give, you serve, you pray in light of his coming. But my sense is that for many of us in this room, and I say this lovingly, we, we can do better. I can do better. So, you know me, I'm gonna get real practical. If it doesn't get up and walk, I struggle. I gotta get practical. So how do we, how do we prepare our hearts? How do we get excited about Jesus' return? Three, three things. Three things. There's more, but I've narrowed it down to three. Number one, we have to pursue intimacy with Jesus. It's a verb. <laughs> we must focus our energies on becoming like Jesus. You ready for this? We must give the best part of who we are to become like Jesus. You know, it's, it's interesting. When we look at giving, God, does God need our money? Of course not. He's God. But what does he say to give? The first fruits, the best part. Because he knows, if it's up to us, I'm like, I got, all this, I got all this bushel of food and I'm gonna give some back. And I'm like, here's some nasty apples. Here, here, God. Ooh, that sheep's kind of scrawny. Here you go. God's like, no, give the best. I'm worthy of it. We must give the best part of who we are to becoming like Jesus. That is, we must pursue the spiritual disciplines with a passion. We must drink deep of his word and prayer and fellowship and fasting and communion. I mean, go on and on. We must consistently find our secret place and get alone with Jesus. We have to cultivate a relationship with the lover of our souls. The more time we spend with him, the more we will long to see him. Let me ask you a question. If you don't know somebody, do you long to see them? Uh, no, that's stupid. Man, when we get around people that we love and then they leave us for whatever reason, we're like, man, come back. Three weeks ago, my wife left me. Okay, let's pray. <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> I just, I love being around my wife and at least she tells me she loves to be around me and We've been married 31 years, going on 32 years, and we can't get enough of each other. And, and three weeks ago, she's like, hey, I'm gonna, she planned it before then, but I'm gonna go with my, they have this group they call the Seasons. You know, summer, fall, uh, but there's five of them, not four, you do the math, but whatever, they're called the Seasons. And they've known each other either from birth, one of the Seasons is Ruth's sister, or 15, 20, 30, 40 years. And they, I call it the five, the five for 50. They're all gonna go celebrate the last person who's turning 50 years old. And they went off, all believers, just to go fellowship and have a great time in Lancaster, hanging out with Amish people, the whole bit. Just go do that. And so I drove her to the airport. And I, there's a part of me that went, man, we're never apart. I, I dropped her off at six o'clock in the morning, that was brutal, in Tulsa. And I thought, I'm, I'm kind of free. Papa's gonna play. That just means just eat bad food and stuff, you know. <laughs> just in my chair, you know. <laughs> That's such a scary visual, please don't. <laughs> I literally, by the time I got back, half a day went by, I was, I was like tears in my, like where's my wife? I'm like where did my right arm go? I'm talking seven hours later. And seriously, it got so bad, I texted her and wrote her so much. Finally, in two days, she's like, hey, um, could you, you just let me be me with my gals? I was like a junior high school boy. I'm like, I miss you. And 
Finally, I wrote back and I said, seriously, last time, I love you. I'm done. I'm done. I'll, I, won't, I won't write you anymore. Ruth and I have spent 31 years cultivating that. Ups, downs, sorrows, joys, prayer, pain, happiness. We've been intentional. Marriage conferences, counseling, we've been intentional. We have to cultivate a relationship with the lover of our souls. The more time we spend with him, the more we long to see him. John could say, come, Lord Jesus, because he couldn't wait to be back with Jesus. Paul could say, I eagerly await because he couldn't wait to be back with Jesus. Often we're like, I don't really know him that well. I mean, we're kind of on a first name basis because I don't know what else to call him but Jesus. But other than that, I'm not that close. If Jesus, now this is my heresy. If Jesus had a love language, it would be quality time with us. He just wants to be with us. Number two, how do we cultivate, how do we cultivate this longing to be excited about his return? We pursue intimacy with Jesus and secondly, we hold stuff loose, loosely and we live sacrificially. Give it away, as Jim often says, our time, our talents, our resources, we give them away. They were given to us freely. Why would we hoard them and hold on to them? It makes no sense. I'm just amazed that people that say, I mean, I, I know and love Jesus, but I'm waiting to, to use my time for his kingdom. I'm waiting to use the gifts he's given me. All the stuff you've given me, I'm holding on to that just to pass it on to my kids. Well, I, th- I think the Bible says that the God will leave an inheritance for their children's children, but I wouldn't leave too much. I wouldn't. Give it away. Give it to kingdom causes. Give it to stuff that matters. Show your kids what really matters in your life. Thirdly, we need to be engaged in activities we won't be ashamed of when he comes. It's a good thing to ask ourselves. Is this place that I'm, gonna, I'm about to go, this thing that I'm about to do, these words that I'm about to say, would I be embarrassed or ashamed to be doing such a thing if Jesus were to come back? If the answer is yes, then we don't need to do it. If we can't pray over our plans with a clear conscience, then we, we need to make other plans. And I would just say this, make plans that matter. Make, make plans that matter. It's, it's important to, get, to take that equip class to draw closer to Jesus. It's important to be a part of serving in children's ministry and youth ministry. It's important to pick up a chair here in just a few minutes. In three weeks, we're going to have a class on, on salt and light. It's just, it's our way of lovingly teaching our people how to share their faith with gentleness, to be salt and light to people. Those are things that matter. Let me conclude with this thought. Everywhere you look, someone has a purpose statement. Every school, every business, every organization. This statement defines who they are and what they, and what they should what they should be doing, what they should become. Here's a question for us. What's our purpose statement as followers of Jesus? And I know there's a lot of things we could do to cultivate that. It'd be be a good exercise. If I were giving homework, if I were teaching this as a class, I would say cultivate a purpose statement and come back next week and we'll talk about it. And I'll do that, that'd be good. But let me help you out. Just to get you started, let me give you a template. I think I found one for us. It describes where our hearts and actions should be in light of Jesus' return. Here it is. Fittingly from the Apostle Peter, but it's in 1 Peter, not 2 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, Peter again says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of, of sins, right? And, and Jesus is coming back. Offer hospitality to one another without, without grumbling. Man, your apartment door, your trailer door, your house door should just be open to people. Believers, unbelievers. And by the way, do it without grumbling. I think if you do it with grumbling, you lose brownie points in heaven. So just be happy about it. Now that's, I don't know if that's theologically true, but you know what I'm saying. 
Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Why? Because Jesus is coming back. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power. He goes to doxology here. He just gets excited. The glory, the power forever and ever. Amen. Okay. As the worship team is, is heading back up, um, I want to do something a little bit different. I mean, it's not that different, but this morning we talked a lot about Christ returning and taking us home. And so I want to ask you, where, where is home? It's a place we don't talk a lot about, at least from the pulpit, but home is heaven. And so after we finish this series on 2 Peter, we're going to start a new series on November 17th. Now you know, if you come to New Heights on a regular basis, we do what's called exegetical verse-by-verse teaching. It's like we're doing in 2 Peter. We go through the text systematically, we pull it out in context, and we try to explain it. Every once in a while, we'll do a series it's still exegetical. I call it topogetical. It's, I made it up. We take a topic, we exegete the topic. We're going to do that on, on heaven. And so we're, we're starting a new series called All Things New. And it's going to be loosely taken from John Eldridge's book. I mean loosely. But it's a great, great book. And so what we've done is out in the foyer um, at our, our book cart, I don't even know what you call it, our, our moving library, you've seen it out there. We've purchased 33 of these books initially, um, and we're charging $10 a book. Such a deal, right? The problem is, in between first and second services, they bought every single book. So I'm selling this book for $200, right? (laughs) Right here. First come, first serve. I'm not. This is mine. Um, Ruth will order more. Okay, you're welcome to get online. You can go to Amazon. You can go to CBD. Uh, whatever, you, can, you know, wherever you think you best can find it. But I think we'll get the cheapest deal. So Ruth is going to order a bunch more of those and we'll have them for next week as well. So you can still get an early start on this new series, okay? Um, but I would encourage you to buy one now or next week and start, uh, start reading it and get ahead of us, okay? Another book on your own you can encourage, we didn't buy them, is a book by um, Randy Alcorn called Heaven. So All Things New is a little book um, Randy Alcorn's book on heaven is a big book and it's really, really good and it'll get you excited about Jesus' return and about where we're going to spend eternity. Uh, let me pray. Let me pray. Father, I, uh, I, I, as I did first service, I confess second service. Um, I love your word and I love this talk and I love being able to, to share of your coming and I get excited thinking about it but I'm reminded that when you come back a second time it it won't be like the first there will be terror and dread for those who don't know you and so my my prayer father is that anyone in this room who doesn't know you that as the scriptures lovingly say that today would be that great day of salvation that they would turn from their lifestyle and their thought patterns and their sin patterns and they would turn to you Jesus as Savior and as Lord of their lives and yet I'm also mindful that for those of us who love you what a great day that will be we'll be made whole and complete and we'll experience for the first time what it means to have no fear no sorrow no pain no death pure joy pure joy So God, tie those things together as only you can. Help us to be a people who long for your return and yet are grateful that you still give us time to share the gospel with those who don't know you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.